Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, and I like to think that I can keep calm in a difficult situation based in my background in psychology and criminal justice. But when I had kids, I was constantly questioning if I was doing things right or how I was messing them up this time. Add in a child with a chronic illness and I found myself full of anxiety. Before my son's diagnosis, it felt like every minute was a ticking time bomb. Is now the time that we should go to the hospital? Are they going to tell me there's nothing wrong again? Or am I overthinking it? Sure, I was keeping it together mostly on the outside, but the overwhelm of staying strong for everyone else was constantly threatening to be too much and result in one of those locked in the bathroom for a quick ugly cry moments. You know what I mean. Momsiety is a real thing for every new parent, and when you add in a chronic illness, food allergy, or other challenging circumstances, it can become downright isolating. And that's why the Momsiety Club is here for you. Each week, we'll discuss all things motherhood, so join me and let's get rid of this Momsiety together. Welcome to episode 29 of the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm Tori Levine, and I am so glad you are here. Today, you'll meet Carly Sachs, mom of two little girls, who shares about her postpartum and breastfeeding experiences, why she started the Mama's List, and we also discuss how her youngest was diagnosed with F-Pies. F-Pies is Food Protein-Induced Entercolitis Syndrome. If you have not already, please make sure you are subscribed to the podcast in your favorite podcast app. That way, you get the newest episodes downloaded right to your phone so your busy mom brain doesn't have one more thing to remember. And it also helps others find the podcast as well. Anything Carly and I talk about in the interview that you may want to go check out after the episode is linked in the show notes. If you are already on the Momsiety Club email list, you will be able to find that info in your inbox. Plus, you also have access to any Momsiety and movement-related freebie that Momsiety Club has created via the free resources page that you also get a link to every week in your email. If you're not yet on that list, simply sign up to receive free resources at join.momsietyclub.com. The link is in the show notes uh, to be automatically added and stay updated on any future specials or new offers from the Momsiety Club. All right, as I mentioned before, Carly is a mom of two lovely ladies, and she is passionate about talking about the reality of motherhood, so we definitely have that in common. She blogs about making the transition to motherhood, parenting, awesome products, and staying sane at the Mama's List, and her hope is that sharing her stories and tips will make this mom gig easier for all of us. Again, We are so connected over that. So her information on how to connect with her and her blog is found in the show notes. And we talk about challenges, breastfeeding, her daughter's F-Pies diagnosis, momsiety, and more. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Carly. Carly, welcome to the Momsiety Club. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yes. Um, I can't wait to hear your whole story and share it with our with the listeners, but can you just introduce yourself very briefly for us and then we'll dive into everything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'm Carly. Um, I am the mom of two little girls. Uh, one is, she will tell you now, four and three quarters. And my youngest is turning one in less than two weeks. So um, yeah, it's been a crazy, you know, past couple of years. Um, I'm also the founder of the Mama's List and I work full-time in brand marketing at a Fortune 500 company. So our house and life is a little bit crazy, but, you know, we love it. That's amazing that you run the mama's list and you are full-time out of the home and you have two girls. I think that is incredible. So just wanted to give you props for that. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Well, first tell us a little bit about the mama's list and kind of why you started it. Uh, Because I think the story is great and it is 
very helpful. I did your breastfeeding class, um, the, the free email course, which has a lot of great gems in it. So if you want to share about that. Absolutely. So, um, I, I started the mama's list when my oldest was just about one, maybe she had just turned one. And that first year of being a mom was just so overwhelming. I just felt like Google and I were like BFF. Um, I was constantly questioning absolutely everything, probably everything you could question. I'm sitting there on Google, like, how do I do this? What do I need to know about this? What about this product? Um, and, you know, on top of that, we weren't sleeping for a year, did not sleep, um, you know, had trouble breastfeeding, just had a lot of those typical new mom challenges, but I'd had so many friends that were moms and like, none of them had told me about this. <laughs> so right. I just, you know, I just kind of was like, what, what, what is this going on right now? What has happened? So um, I spent so much time, you know, searching for all those answers and then just really wanted to create a, you know, help for other new moms and a space for other new moms to get those answers um, from someone that had done all of this research and that they could feel like they trusted and, you know, really to just build a community because even though I had other friends that had gone through it, it still seemed like a lot of the time I was so alone um, with some of those questions that I was having. So created the mama's list, um, you know, as a resource guide, and then um, eventually created the free breastfeeding course and some of the other products that I've come up with. But at first it was really just truly a resource um, to answer all of those new mom questions that I seem to spend, you know, hundreds of hours searching on Google for. Yeah. That, that I can relate to that as well. All the searches. And I love in some of our previous chats, you said about you're a list maker and (laughs) yes, (laughs) I, I feel like you cover the stuff that most of the time pregnant moms aren't even thinking about because like you're saying, it's not discussed and it's not something we need to learn about. And that was one of the things If I could go back, I wouldn't have researched all the, the gadgets as much as I would have researched what to do when the baby's actually here and we're having trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's, um, that's the, one of the biggest mistakes I see moms to be like making. And of course I was a hundred percent guilty of this myself. I spent, you know, hundreds of hours researching for my registry and, you know, which stroller was the best. And it's, you know, like, I mean, the stroller goes on the sidewalk, it's fine. Um, the thing that I wasn't prepared for was, you know, the first two weeks when I came home with my baby, and, you know, we're both crying because she's not breastfeeding well. And like, I was convinced she, you know, she was super small and, you know, I was so worried about her output and weight gain and, you know, all of those things that, um, you know, I had taken a breastfeeding class for one hour in the hospital with a doll Mm -hmm. and it just, you know, didn't cut it. And so I think that's absolutely a mistake that so many new moms make is you spend so much time on the stuff and the gadgets and, um, you know, or for on labor even. You know, like, because labor is super scary, um, you know, if you've never gone through it. And so you spend a lot of time preparing for like that one day and that one event, um, but you don't actually get ready for what life is going to be like once you're actually a mom. Right. Well, you talked a little bit about your breastfeeding struggles and how that can previously cause anxiety. And did that cause a lot of anxiety for you? And how did you handle that? And how did you get through your breastfeeding struggles? Absolutely. And we, I'm, we had trouble, different kinds of trouble, but with, with both my daughters, even as a mom, I, after my first, I breastfed for 19 months and I still, with my second had some trouble, which, you know, you would think, oh, you've done this before, you know, you've got this. Um, And with, they were just very different challenges with each girl. And, um, it's so much anxiety. And so for me specifically, uh, my first daughter was five pounds, 10 ounces when she was born at full term. Um, but then dropped down to five pounds, four ounces. I mean, she was like this tiny little nugget and I was convinced, you know, she, she couldn't lose any more weight. You know, the pediatricians were having us come in for weight checks and she, she was gaining, but it was just so painful. And, you know, she had a lip tie. We just had to work through, I was, we were having bruising issues, you know, just basically all those new mom struggles. Um, I had seen, you know, multiple lactation consultants, it, you know, we just couldn't get it 
to work without really hurting. But I was convinced, you know, I was like, no, we're, we're doing this. Like I refuse to quit. Um, and so I think those are the things that you kind of, they kind of trip you up, you know, it's like, it's all or nothing, or it's one way or the other. And so you get like this intense anxiety over, is this going to work? Am I doing the right things? Like what's really going on? And so I think that was really challenging with my first, I mean, eventually, you know, we figured it out. Um, and then I was just obsessed with the ounces. So like after getting through that newborn phase, of like, is this going to work? Then, you know, the going back to work phase and the anxiety of, am I going to have enough? How many times a day do I need to pump? Is it, you know, every time the baby's eating or do I need extra pumps? Like, should I wake up in the middle of the night to pump? You know, there's just all of those questions that just continue to go through your mind. Um, And one would think that, okay, well, you've done, you know, if you've made it through breastfeeding one child successfully, you know, especially if you've made it to a full year, which, you know, a lot of people, don't do that, you know, the full first year, um, you think, oh, it'll just be super easy the next time. And it's just so different with every child. Mm -hmm. So with my second, we ended up, I didn't know this because I should have, I had looked at all of the the breastfeeding research and some of the common challenges. Um, but she had a tongue tie that we didn't even know about until she was seven months old. And she had all of the classic symptoms, but I'd had her evaluated and they said, oh no, she's fine. And she's gaining weight. So she's okay. Um, but I was convinced she had feeding challenges and the pediatrician just kept telling me, no, she's fine. So that's very interesting. That's actually what happened with my first where the lactation consultant had said, you know, I think it's a tongue tie. I think it's a tongue tie, but the pediatricians never, um, they said, no, you know, that shouldn't cause an issue. Um, and then we did take him and he got a revision and he also had a lip tie, which nobody had even seen. Um, but then the second time we knew because we had that experience, knew exactly what to look for and called, I think while we were still in the hospital, (laughs) the elastic surgeon that we went to and we're like, okay, let's get this one fixed because we could see uh, that already. So Yeah, that's so smart just to, and then that's, I mean, that was another huge mistake that I made. I thought, oh, we were latching. Okay. I have done this before. And I didn't have, I had asked for lactation to come in the hospital. And I don't, I don't remember what happened, but for some reason they didn't come that first day. And we saw a nurse and they said, oh, you don't need anyone. Right. And I said, sure, it's fine. And so with my second daughter, a lactation consultant didn't even evaluate her. And uh, my first, it had a lip, a lip tie revised. Um, we knew the second had a lip tie, but because I wasn't in pain and she was gaining weight, we thought things were okay. I didn't realize until much later, like the gagging and the choking and all of the other issues. And then she had issues with solids. That's really how we found out that she had this tongue tie, um, was that she couldn't actually swallow her solids. And we realized later that she couldn't actually swallow her own drool. She, she wasn't living in a puddle of drool because she was teething. She was living in a puddle of drool because she couldn't actually swallow her own saliva. So, um, we didn't, and we didn't find that out until, you know, seven months, seven months in. So definitely, you know, seeing lactation and like, if, especially if you have history of that, I didn't realize that it has a genetic component. So, um, if one baby has your much higher likelihood to have another baby with, um, the same, you know, scenario. So yeah, I just made a mistake on that one, but uh, we figured it out. Yeah. You figured it out. And we learn and (laughs) move on. Um, So you talk a lot about that in your course and like put your experience in and what I love so much about it. Now we're, we're going off topic right now, but (laughs) but on topic at the same time, what I love so much about it is that it's not the lactation consultant saying, well, this is the way, this is what you have to do. It's coming from you, another mom who you experienced it. So you're feeling it so that other moms are able to kind of relate and see that they are able to get through these challenges. And I love how you put it earlier. It's not all or nothing. There's a lot that goes with it. And also you have gone back to work pumped and continued that is a huge challenge for tons of moms and a huge um, worry because they don't know they're fine on maternity leave, but how are they going to continue that? So I just want to, again, 
promote you as a great resource and the mama's list as a great resource, especially for those moms who don't know where to look, who are planning and returning to work and are just anxious because they're not sure how they're going to continue um, if it's something they want to continue. So that's my thank little you. Side no, note. thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> that, yeah, that was, I mean, you know, it's a huge stress, you know, like once you get through that first phase, you know, you figured it out. You're like, I've got this. I've learned to breastfeed. I, you know, you probably, I mean, if you are one of those um, unicorn breastfeeding moms who has no trouble, the baby immediately latches. There is no pain. Everything is sunshine and roses. Like that's amazing. But most of the time, that's not the case. There's at least some sort of like learning curve or a challenge you have to work through. And, you know, once you make it through that, you're like so excited and you have this great breastfeeding relationship and you, you know, you don't want it to end. And, um, it really is stressful thinking, okay, well, what am I going to do when I go back to work, especially, and I know this isn't as relevant, you know, in 20, 2020, 2021, but like, um, what if you have to travel, what if you have to be away from your baby? Like there are just so many other considerations, um, you know, the, once you go back to work that, you know, if you're going to be away from the baby, um, that you don't have to think about the first couple of months. So it's, it's definitely doable, even though it is, you know, pretty daunting. Um, but if I can do it, anybody can do it. So just want to, just want to throw that out there. It is totally possible. Um, even if you think you're not sure, you know, you're like, how is this going to work for me? Um, but it can. And just along those lines, I work from home. I work part-time and trying to figure out nursing while working and not going back and forth to like interrupt the day. Even Mm -hmm. that was a challenge and I didn't have to worry about pumping and leaving and all that stuff. So yeah, it's relatable to so many as well. Absolutely. Um, So you talked about seeing a lactation consultant, but who did you have as your other supports um, during the challenges that you faced? So I will say um, during, with my first, we had a birth doula who we also hired um, for a few postpartum hours. So we had like a postpartum doula, Um, you know, she was our birth doula as well. And she happened to be a lactation consultant. So I really lucked out in the sense that like we, I, we hired her for some lactation hours as well as the other support. Um, I did see a lactation consultant at um, the pediatrician. And just to be clear, like not all lactation consultants are created equal. So I have gotten some poor lactation advice right. as well. Um, but I was super lucky to have that with my first, um, to have that doula who like immediately she supported me um, with latch and lactation immediately after birth, and then, um, continued with that postpartum support. And so I, I remember even this was in, you know, 2016, I was doing a FaceTime lactation appointment with her because my daughter was, you know, freaking out, pulling off the breast, wouldn't latch. And I was like, what do I do right now? So that was absolutely critical. Um, I don't want to say, oh, I couldn't have done it without her because I'm sure, you know, like there are other resources, but it was so, so helpful. And I will say I couldn't have done it without support. And I think that's something that new moms need to hear. Like just because you, you know, feel like you need help or because you do need help, that's fine. And that's normal. And a lot of times like you can't do it without help. And, you know, moms have been momming for, you know, forever for hundreds of thousands of years, but like, that's not, there's um, been support a right, lot exactly. more previously than there exactly. is now. Definitely. Exactly. You know, we haven't all been doing it all on our own forever. So don't think that that's the only way. Perfect. Perfect little sound bite there <laughs> and <laughs> words of wisdom. Um, well, I would love then to move to our next big topic. And this definitely relates to. Um, a lot of things that I've been talking about recently on the podcast and how I've been getting a lot of feedback about is F pies. So where did that come in? How did you figure that out? And kind of what did you do? Were you having any idea what was going on? Were you, did that like spike your anxiety? All of those things. Yes. Um, yes. To all of the questions. Um, so 
F pies, we, I had no idea what F pies was until probably about six months ago um, with my second daughter. Um, we had started on solids. So again, both my girls uh, were exclusively breastfed. Uh, I have never had formula or, you know, had any other supplements before six months. So the only nutrition they had ever, you know, received was breast milk uh, from me or from a bottle. And so I didn't know, you know, a lot of F pies babies are diagnosed early at when they have intolerances to, um, to either formula or soy or et cetera, other things. Um, but we went and introduced rice cereal as I think it was our, se- it was our second food. We had done avocado first. Um, And our first daughter loved rice cereal so much, probably because we just mixed it with breast milk and she was familiar with the texture and the, you know, um, the flavor. So she really loved it. And I thought, oh, maybe, you know, baby number two will like this as well. Um, We introduced it. There was no reaction the first time. She seemed like she loved it. Um, We gave it a couple of times and I, I think it was her third exposure. Um, The first she had like really not very much at all, like a couple of spoonfuls. But her third exposure, she had an F pies reaction, um, which is I'm I'm guessing if you're um, getting no, feedback on this, most people know what it is. But no, explain, please explain. Okay. Um, but uh, the F pies reaction that we had is it's a gastrointestinal reaction. Um, it's not an anaphylactic allergy, so you don't get the hives or the throat closing. But a few hours after ingestion of the trigger food, um, there is like massive profuse vomiting. And it happens multiple uh, times over a course of a few hours. So for this first reaction, our daughter threw up every 20 to 30 minutes for two hours. And I mean, there was nothing left in there. Just this tiny little baby, she was six months old and we're just like holding her, you know, over one of those basins and she's just so sick. And um, the scary thing about F pies, I mean, besides the fact that it's just like really scary to see your baby vomit that much um, is that the, it can cause rapid dehydration and lead to shock and blood pressure dropping. Um, so of course, like, I think she has a stomach bug because you know, what, what else would I think? I went to pick her up and she, um, she was soaked. I went to give her a dream feed and I called to my husband and said, Oh, I, I think she's vomited. Can you come up here? And when we sat her up, she just started like profusely vomiting. Um, and so I'm thinking she has this stomach bug and, she's, you know, at this point it's almost midnight. We're changing her and she's like falling. I say, Oh, she's so tired. She's falling asleep. Uh, looking back, she was probably somewhat in some stage of passing out, but because I didn't know what was happening, Mm -hmm. I thought, Oh, she's just, um, you know, she's so tired because she's been vomiting for a couple hours and it's midnight. We might as well put her to sleep and, and she'll be, you know, hopefully not so sick all night. Um, she woke up a few hours later, nursed, didn't get sick. I said, okay, this is great. Um, and then woke up in the morning, nursed again, and she never threw up again. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's the weirdest stomach bug anybody's ever had. Um, nobody else in our family got it. You know, I'm mm-hmm. thinking, oh, I heard these are so contagious. It was the first time we've had multiple children. So I'm like, oh my gosh, waiting for like us to have the plague upon our household <laughs> and nothing, you know, everything seemed fine. Um, And I called, I think I called the doc. No, I didn't even call the doctor. I think um, I just said, okay, I'll let's see. Like, I'm sure it wasn't the rice cereal, but I'm going to give it to her during the day next time. So we waited a week. Um, If she seemed fine, nobody was sick. I gave her the rice cereal again in the afternoon and literally the exact same thing happened. Um, But luckily it was earlier in the day this time. And um, I went to pick her up from a nap. It was about exactly three hours again after she had eaten the food. And she started vomiting every 10 to 15 minutes and same thing lasted for two, two and a half hours. Um, and I, then of course, this time I was like, oh, she's fine because she had this reaction last week and it was totally okay. Even though what probably wasn't okay, but, um, I at least thought, oh, she doesn't have some sort of horrible stomach bug. I at least know what caused this and she'll be okay. Um, of course, as soon as like she went to bed that night, um, I started Googling like rice allergy because Google and I are best friends. And, um, I'm thinking, no, no babies have rice allergies, right? Like I think, um, that's, that's not a thing. Um, it is a thing by the way. (laughs) See that I would be the same way because everybody was like, rice is the safest thing, you know, all that. 
Exactly. So. That's I, you know, oh, it's hypoallergenic. I'm doing my air quotes because like, yeah. I, like, there's no such thing as like hypoallergenic food, but um, yeah. So that's what we thought. And I even, I called my pediatrician. I said, Hey, there's this thing called F pies. And I swear my daughter has it. Like, I know you probably think I'm like this crazy, like helicopter mom, like diagnosing her, you know, like Dr. Google and I, Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm telling you like, this is, I'm reading these stories of these F pies reactions This is exactly what happened to her. And this nurse calls me back and she said, uh, well, just don't give her rice anymore. I'm like, yes, clearly let's, (laughs) let's not do that. Um, and she said, we'll just reassess at her nine months. And I'm like, she's six and a half months old. Like, what do you like, just wait. And I'm, you know, of course wow. I'm freaking out. So mm-hmm. of course, like my, my anxiety is through the roof because I'm thinking, does she have anaphylactic allergies? What does this mean for food introduction? Like this is her second mm-hmm. food. She's never, you know? Um, so I of course was not about to take that, uh, at face value. I said, okay. And then just kind of hung up the phone and thought, what can I do here? And, um, I saw that CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, has an f clinic. And at the time, they it said they had been doing telehealth appointments. And so I called and they had just switched out of telehealth back to in-person visits. And I said, you know, my pediatrician really doesn't think this is that big of a deal, but I would just like to be seen. I don't think I need to drive you know, multiple hours to come go to the doctor, but could someone just see me on telehealth? Like, is that even possible? And I got really lucky and, you know, they got me in an appointment three days later. Oh, wow. And so that was super lucky because within four days from the time of her second reaction. um, So this was within a two week span. um, Of course, I won't. So I got my appointment and within two weeks uh, she'd been diagnosed with FBI. So an hour long appointment, the first thing that the allergist said was, no, that's a hundred percent classic F pies. Um, it's a diagnosis of history, like a history diagnosis. We don't even need to see her. Mm-hmm. You can manage it virtually, you know, and, um, and yeah. And so I was like, okay. And so I felt like so validated that I wasn't right. crazy, you know, that I did the right thing. I 100% hear you on being, feeling validated because that is exactly how I felt with things. That's how I think a lot of moms, especially moms of kids who have like F pies, chronic illness, something, um, even sick, any type of sickness, you know, if you're anxious and that all also adds into it. I talked about it on a previous episode of like, you make yourself anxious because you're going to call. And like you said, they're going to think you're, you know, helicopter parent or diagnosing your child and on and on and on. And at some point you have to say, well, like, like you did, I'm going to just double check. It's not going to hurt. Who's it going to hurt to double check? Nobody. hundred percent. And I think honestly, the one thing that that taught me like more than, you know, yeah, you're right. Like it doesn't hurt to double check just, you know, it's, it's not, there, there is no shame in that. It only, even if it's just to satisfy your anxiety, (laughs) there's no shame in that. Um, but also like you are your child's advocate. And so even though, you know, I had called the pediatrician and I thought, Oh, I did the right thing. Um, and was dismissed. And, Mm -hmm. you know, had I just taken that at face value, I don't know what would have happened because we got, but everyone we've talked to since then, I realized like we've, um, been diagnosed, we've been in early intervention and our occupational therapist has said like, you are so lucky for catching it early. And when you did, because you knew what the trigger food was, Mm -hmm. um, you hadn't gone down the road of introducing 10, 20, 30 foods. Um, rice flour is in a lot of baby food, by the way, it's a thickener. And so even if it's not like a, a common, you know, if it's not like chicken and rice, it's hidden in there. And so she could have had so many other reactions and we wouldn't have even known um, where it was coming from. And so I think, you know, that's the one thing that I kind of took away from this is that like, I felt like something was wrong. Mm-hmm. I, I just knew that it wasn't right. Yes. It was, you know, coming from a place of anxiety because I obviously am anxious, but like you are your child's advocate. And if you don't feel like something is right, like it's up to you to speak up because, you know, they can't. Yes. And I, that is, 
there's tons of messages I try to convey, but that is definitely one of them. Um, because yes, we're anxious. This is mom'sxiety. <laughs> we're we have it. We can talk ourselves into and out of a million things, but there is that time when you trust your gut. Like generally, there's anxiety and then there's like that deeper gut feeling of you know something is off and it's not just, you know, that it's going to rain tomorrow. So, you know, my kid's going to catch a cold or something. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I didn't know of an example to make up, but um, now did she, I don't remember from our previous conversations, did, is she diagnosed with any other allergies or was it, is it just the rice as you know of right now? Yep. So far it's just the rice. Um, and we actually super lucky, um, like, because a lot of kids have multiple triggers. So, so far it's just the rice and grains were our, um, high risk category because she's allergic to rice. And we actually just made it today. I think it was day seven of oats. So we got the go ahead to start introducing grains at a year. We're not quite there, but our allergist said we could start at 11 months. And um, so we have done, we're on day seven of Cheerios, which is amazing when you're, you have a child that loves to pick up little round foods and you can't give them grains, bread, puffs, right. any of the little round kid food <laughs> that mm-hmm. kids like to eat. So um, that's huge for us like that. I think we're going to, I mean, obviously I haven't gone through the rest of the grains, but um, the fact that if she can have like a cereal or something like that, that she can pick up and eat and even just have oatmeal, which is also in a lot of baby food. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. When you have that one thing, that's great. I, we kind of dealt with that with Ruben, my first, because he, well, both of mine had, um, you know, intolerances through breast milk, which um, then Ruben, we found out had a gluten intolerance after we introduced solid. So who knows if it was similar, he did not have the classic reaction, but actually on a previous episode, I talked to a mom, Allison, whose daughter had F pies, but she was diagnosed super early because of, um, formula Mm -hmm. interactions and hers was not the classic. That's why it was so hard. She went through doctor after doctor after doctor, um, because hers was digestive, um, malabsorption. She never had like the spitting up. So, wow. Yeah. I, I did not realize prior to that, that there could be the, the non-classical, I guess, <laughs> symptoms. So it sounds like you handled everything wonderfully. You knew what to do. You called and you were proactive. Was there anything else that you did to kind of help yourself while going through the whole process? Um, well, I will share. So, because again, this is mom anxiety, um, my anxiety spiral after that, after the diagnosis and because, um, and what you just mentioned, like you, your, that your son's had intolerances through breast milk. I felt so lucky and so grateful that my daughter didn't have that because I had been eating Chipotle straight through, you know, the first six <laughs> months of her life. Um, so she was, she was getting rice all the time, but, um, so she, I didn't have that, but where my anxiety really kicked in was, um, what I then didn't know, well, could she have formula? Could she have, like, I didn't know what those other trigger foods were or mm-hmm. could be, you know, it was just, right. I, I knew that the classical foods were, you know, soy, dairy, um, grains, you know, some of the other, you know, corn squash, whatever, you know, whatever, sweet potatoes, um, like I knew what those were, but I didn't know what her reactions would be. And so then of course I started worrying about, well, you know, again, I went into the spiral of supply. Like what if my supply goes down and I can't or, you know, supply her with breast milk. And then, you know, are we going to have challenges? And of course Mm -hmm. they have alternatives for, for these babies. Like, you know, I mean, they, they don't starve. So, um, you know, there are hypoallergenic formulas. They actually, that does exist. So there are other solutions, but at the time when I didn't know I didn't know about all of that. That was where I kind of went down a rabbit hole. Um, And I just kind of had to take a step back and say, okay, well, what can I control right now? Um, And so we were also going through, the reason I was so nervous was because she was super distracted while she was breastfeeding. Um, And she should basically like kind of quit breastfeeding during the day for a couple months, I think probably around seven months, seven and eight months. She just was Mm -hmm. not interested. 
Um, but she, she loved breastfeeding all night. So I was up all night, <laughs> uh, you know, every two hours, it was great. Um, so anyway, we, I mean, we powered through, but I think what I, you know, kind of had to say was what can I control? How can I, um, help her through this? And so that was one, it was one of the reasons I continued. I took an extra long maternity leave with, uh, baby number two. And one of the reasons, um, you know, all, other than the rest of the things going on in, in the world right now, um, was that I just wanted to feel really confident about, um, her health when she went back into daycare. Mm-hmm. So, um, it is, that is a challenge for babies with FI is like, how do you introduce foods in a setting when, um, the child isn't with you? And so, you know, our nutritionist had said, it's not great if you're going to give her a new food and then go and send her into daycare. And especially if you're trialing foods over seven days or even longer in some cases, um, you know, you wonder, well, am I ever going to get my kid enough foods to have like a well-rounded diet? Mm -hmm. If, you know, they're gone five days a week, we're trying foods on the weekend. You know, if you do the math pretty quickly, you're saying like, I get one new food a month, you know, what, you know, what, how does this work? So, um, that was one of the reasons that I just said, okay, what can I control? How can I fix this for myself? And like, you know, what can I focus on? And so that was one of the things that I did, you know, for my own mental sanity was to just say, okay, I'm already, you know, on a longer leave. I'm going to continue to stay out. I'm not going back earlier than anticipated. And we're going to get her as many foods as we can, you know, before she turns one. I'm happy for you that you were able to do that to help your sanity. As you said. Yes. <laughs> um, and how are you preparing yourself because you're nearing the end of that time? Is that right? Yes. Going back in two weeks. So how are you feeling now? Um, so I will not lie to you. It is hard every time you go back. So I've done this before. I know what it's like. Um, I, so I'm definitely, again, I think anything you do the second time, you're less anxious than you were when it's just this total black box of unknown, but it is going to be a total change in our routine, um, you know, transition. So what I'm doing now is, um, we're easing into it, which is nice and which I recommend to everybody in any situation. So whatever that looks like for you. Um, but we actually, this is her second week already at daycare. She's going part-time right now and she'll go full-time when I'm back full-time. Um, but we decided that she, it would be too much too stressful for her, uh, to go full-time in daycare after being home with me for, you know, a year. Mm -hmm. and then go full-time immediately. Um, And we realized that she has a case of uh, pandemic style attachment where she has never seen other adults. And so um, she basically screams when she sees other people who aren't her parents because she's literally been quarantined her entire life. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was, that was really hard to like realize that that was going on. And so we, I made the decision. I had wanted to keep her home as long as possible. I even considered keeping her home after going back to work full time, um, would have been really hard, but like, I just thought, what, what can I do here? And we just made the decision that it was better to get her acclimated and around babies and other adults and to send her to daycare earlier, even though it wasn't what I initially wanted. Um, so she's on her second week. And um, she even took a nap today. So that's great. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I also find it that right around a year too is hard because even pandemic aside and not seeing other adults, there's that, I want to just be with mom. Mm-hmm. I don't care. And I'm just going to scream. We, there were several times, and this was pre-pandemic right before he turned, my youngest turned one, that I couldn't even make it up to steps. I had somebody helping. And like, then it was just so I could try to get something done around the house. And literally he was standing, clinging to my leg, or I was holding him just looking at this other person. So yeah, I totally <laughs> you get have that. like the yep. double, uh, double whammy going on right now. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that's, I, you know, I thought I was prepared for that because my daughter did not to that level, I think, because she was in daycare very early at, you know, I think five months or right before five months. Um, so it wasn't to that same level, like that you just described, but she absolutely, I think it was nine to 10 months ish started mm-hmm. just like, wouldn't even, didn't even want her dad to hold her. You know, right. he, she saw him as much as she saw me. 
Um, we were both working outside of the home full time, but like just super attached, which was really, you know, really sweet from, as from a mom's perspective, right. but like <laughs> not great in practicality. Right. Um, yeah. But then like, yeah, when you add in that level of like, I'd never, you know, never seen other adults, never left the house. And then this baby that has been with me every single day, all day for, mm-hmm. you know, almost a year. And then, yeah, it was just, um, you know, she was not thrilled about this, about that. Wow. So. I'm glad to hear that she took a nap today and we'll continue hoping for improvements, however small they are each day for you. Both. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Um, So at the end of each episode, when I have a guest, I like to ask two questions. And one is, what have you done for yourself this week? Because self-care, realistic self-care, not, you know, not every day we can go to the spa or get a massage or any of those things. But so what's something realistic that you have done to take care of yourself so that you're better able to take on momming when the kids come home? Um, well, I actually have two things, which is super Ooh. exciting. Um, well, one, and this is not, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm a fan of retail therapy. Um, <laughs> and so it looks a little different right now, but still a fan. And we just found kite baby clothes. I don't know if you've heard of this. They're bamboo baby clothes. It's just called kite baby. It's K Y T E. I'd never heard of it. I found it in some group. Um, and we got literally the softest sleep bag. They're like bamboo sleep bags. I've ever felt for our daughter and we are obsessed with it. We've had it for a couple months now and they just had this like crazy sale. Um, I think it, it was over this weekend and they have adult pajamas <laughs> and I bought myself some. <laughs> so now oh, I have bamboo baby pajamas. They're not baby pajamas. They are adult size, but I was so excited that like she has this sack that's like literally I want to get in there with her. It's so amazing. (laughs) And I got adult like jogger pajamas and I am so excited. I can't wait for them to come. Oh, wow. Um, and then today, so this was the, maybe the second full day that she's been, uh, she was gone a full day last week, but a a full day that she was gone. They both, both my daughters, my husband took them to daycare this morning. Um, and after the craziness of the morning, trying to get everybody out of the house and all the lunches together and the milk packed, et cetera, I sat down with my cup of coffee and my breakfast and watched the news for 10 minutes before I was thinking, oh, I'm going to come sit in front of my computer and get, start getting stuff done and, you know, do all that. And I sat down for 10 minutes before it takes them like literally 15 minutes to get there and back. Um, and I watched the news with my coffee and breakfast. Oh, that's amazing. (laughs) It was, it was truly, I'm like, it was so quiet. It was amazing. Yeah. Well, great job. <laughs> great job, Thank Mama. You. Um, and then my other question is, what advice would you have given yourself as a new mom now looking back? Oh Either gosh. time. Either yes. Time. Um, I think I, there's so much, so many things I would tell my new mom self, but one is just, it doesn't, it might not look like you thought it was going to look and it's okay. Um, and it's still, even if it isn't what you thought, it still can be really, really amazing. And so whether that's like with breastfeeding, because I know so many new moms like struggle, like they, I I don't want to say, Oh, I have this great success story, but we struggled, but then we've continued to prevail. There are a lot of new moms that like struggle and then have to stop or decide to stop for their mental health, like whatever the reason, or they have a health challenge and you know, it doesn't work out. Like It might not look the way you think, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be bad. And so I think that's one thing that I just wish I had like, as a new mom, not been so like committed to what it's supposed to look like, or, you know, with sleep, like, oh, your baby will sleep by two months old, you know, from the hospital. And you think you're like a failure if your baby, and by the the way, number two, still not sleeping great. So, you know, like you just have to kind of say, it's not always going to look the way you thought. And it's okay. That is excellent advice. And um, my just turned two year old still, not so much. Oh no, Uh, don't tell me that. You know, he's done well. And now I can count more than on two hands that when he slept through, but, and both of them were that way. So I kind of expected it. The downside is though that the youngest does not come into our bed 
at night, like with my older one, after he was like 13, 15 months, I would bring him when he would wake up, come sleep in our bed so I could mm-hmm. sleep. No, this one screams bloody murder. And he's like, no, mommy Milky's in the rocking chair. <laughs> but mommy needs to sleep. (laughs) Oh no. So you're stuck in there. So we're stuck, but, um, yes, that is not how I imagined. I imagined he would be in the bed. Nice. And, you know, at least you could relax and right. Right. Oh my gosh. You said how sometimes moms stop if they're struggling with breastfeeding or anything along those lines. Um, because like mental health for their comfort, all those different types of things. And I had to kind of fight against that with my second, I pumped for probably three months or more. And, um, people were like, well, why don't you just give him formula? Why don't you do this? I said, because even though this is awful right now, I know from my experience with my first that it is easier in the end when things finally hit that groove. So even if you imagine things one way, yes, you are better at guiding your own path, but don't take what other people are saying as like, Oh, but wouldn't it be easier to do this? If you know, in the end, this is truly what you want to do, you know, that's such good advice. That's so true. Like, I mean, and I think that also happens. And so I'm guessing you were, as you were working through like intolerances, I think that's probably one of the main reasons that moms who have a supply do quit is because they realize there's other issues with a lot of other external pressures to say, Oh, well, wouldn't this be easier? And it's like, well, we don't really know unless you're in someone's shoe, what would be easier for them or what would make them, you know, um, you know, more fulfilled or like happy, you know, if you, this is just something you want to do, if you want to provide breast milk for your baby, you know, like it, maybe it isn't easier for you to quit, you know, like that might actually be harder for you to like, stop, you know, make the decision to stop and switch to something else. So I think, you know, everybody has to do what's going to be right for them, but that's yeah. absolutely like, you know, just because somebody says, this might be easier doesn't always mean it's going to be easier for you. Right. At easy is relative. So yes, I like to say that. Um, well, please tell us how um, listeners can get in contact with you. I will also include all of the info in the show notes. Yeah. Um, so the mama's list, it's spelled funny with two M. So it's the M A M M A S L I S T because I love lists. So uh, the mama's list.com um, you can go there and then right on the homepage, you can find the free breastfeeding course. You can find a free baby prep course. Um, I will link at some point. I have a baby prep one oh one webinar. Um, I'll be putting that up at some point, but you can get all of the free courses um, right off the homepage or in the shop. And um, we, I would love to see you in some of them. A lot of them are video based with email delivery, um, or you can join the pregnancy and postpartum new mom support group that's linked in a bunch of them. It's on Facebook as well. And so I'm in there all the time. Um, I host that group. And if you have questions, you can tag me directly or just shoot me an email. Um, oh, Carly at the mama's list.com. All right. Well, thank you again so much for joining me. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This was fun. Well, thank you, Carly, again. I just want to recap. We did cover a lot of different things, but with regards to feeding your baby, you have to do what is right for you. Do what works for you. Trust your gut, mama. You know, ask for a second opinion if you feel like something's not right. You, as Carly said, you have to advocate for your child. And I think that as we grow into being mothers as our children grow, that we learn that more and more and that, you know, that anxiety can come back, that you're worried about being that anxious mom, that one who's always asking or worried about different things. But in the end, you are doing what you think is best for your child and in their best interest. So, You just have to trust your gut and ask the questions if you feel like they need to be asked uh, or if something is getting glossed over. 
All right. We also said that easy is a relative term. Uh, and that's true because you can take advice from someone because it worked for them, but it might not work for you. You are a completely different person. Your baby is a completely different person from their baby. So, you know, it's, it's that take things with a grain of salt. Um, and again, trust your gut and do what works for you. In the last few episodes, I shared more of my anxiety story and what was going on when my son was diagnosed with very early onset inflammatory bowel disease and my gratefulness for the care we were able to access. As a way of paying it forward, when you join the Momxiety Club, where you get access to a wonderfully supportive group of moms where you can ask whatever questions or just vent, join in on weekly exercise classes or watch the replays to give your body and mind a little boost so you are refreshed for the rest of the week and so much more. Your first month's fee is donated to a charity that benefits families and children who are handling a chronic illness or disability. As a new member this month, you'll be supporting the Child Life Fund at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Child Life staff assist children and their families in coping with an illness, injury, or procedure. The Child Life Fund also enables staff to have activities and toys on hand for kids going through um, any time in the hospital or a procedure. And as I mentioned in the last few episodes and Carly mentioned today, CHOP is a leader in research and treatment of both FPIs and VEO, IBD. So you get access to an amazing group of moms and movement to help you reduce your mom's anxiety and a charity benefits that benefits children and families. So that is a win-win in my book. Just head to join.momsietyclub.com and the link to join is in the show notes as well. Again, I want to say a big thank you to Carly for sharing her story and I'd love to hear from you. What did you relate to most in today's episode? To respond, to let me know, email hello at momsietyclub.com or reach out to Momsiety Club on Facebook and Instagram. If you enjoyed today's episode, I would be honored if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And if you're not already, remember to subscribe to the podcast and share with a friend who you think would benefit or just share an episode on social media. And To end the episode, I personally want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy mom life to listen. I know that your time is incredibly valuable and I am honored that you've set aside some time to join me and Carly today, whether it be while you're on a walk on your own or you're multitasking with your little one in tow. Thanks again for joining me and until next week, which is actually, um, next week is Random Acts of Kindness Day and Week. So next week, I'm going to be talking about kindness and what random acts of kindness can do both for yourself and for others and giving you some ideas of things that you can do with your kids, if they're toddlers, if they're old enough, and um, things that you can do to help out another mom. As always, if you have any examples that you would like to share of something that was one of the most random acts of kindness that you received as a new mom or some random acts of kindness that you like to do, please email hello at momsietyclub.com or you can go and record a voicemail to be shared on next week's episode at join.momsietyclub.com and just click the leave a voicemail button that pops up. All right, until next week, I will see you on social media at Momsiety Club or inside the Momsiety Club membership. Here's to getting rid of some of our momsiety. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK.
The Momsiety Club membership is full of a group of amazingly supportive moms and pre- and postnatal fitness tips and exercises to help you mentally and physically. The first month's fee for all new members this month is being donated to the Child Life Fund at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. When you're ready to join other mamas getting through the ups, downs, and anxieties of motherhood, head to join.momsietyclub.com to become a member and check out the Ultimate Momsiety Relief Package.